it turns out that in many aspects and also for a huge range of astrophysical problems, what we actually need to do if we want to like cook or bake fake universes is actually reverse engineer the recipe. You can think of this as sort of trying to bake this cake, but there is no recipe. We do not have the recipe for the universe. We just need to guess it. A way to do it is we can take the final product, say the cake, and essentially by observing it, tasting it, testing it, we can try to figure out the recipe to reproduce it. The only way to test that recipe is actually to put it into practice and to cook, or in this case, bake a cake. And then at the end, we can conduct the same observations and see whether the taste, the smell and structure are the same as the cake you want to reverse engineer. And of course, just like if you wanted to reverse engineer a cake, doing this for a universe leads to a lot of trial and error and plenty of burnt or failed cakes. For example, it was through computer simulations that we realized that if you do not include dark matter, you'll get really burnt cakes, which don't resemble the universe at all. The reason for this is that structure formation is so slow that it would take so much time for the gas to collapse under its own weight and start forming stars that actually universes that do not contain dark matter will just not contain any stars or galaxies at all. And the expansion of the universe just wins. For those universes, then the universe after 13.7 billion years would simply be cold and dark. On top of these very failed universes, people have spent tens and tens of years essentially changing the recipes and also the physics that you put in and the processes that you follow to try to get a universe that at the end resembles our own. By doing a lot of work, we now have a decent basic recipe of how you would make a universe that as far as we can tell is flat in terms of its geometry. If you wanted to do a universe with about one kilogram in mass, these are the sort of ingredients you'd need. Most of it is in the form of dark energy. So you need almost 700 grams of dark energy. The other main ingredient is dark matter. And we'll see why we need cold dark matter. So something like 268 grams. And then there's only about five grams that you'd be adding from baryons. But these baryons are sort of the source of the recipe actually really matter because they allow you to have all the other physical interactions that will allow the systems to cool down, to send supernova feedback events, stellar winds, and AGN to radiate, everything else. It's a tiny little amount in the universe that it makes a big, big difference. And then once you have the recipe, it's all about actually cooking, which in this case, we cook it in supercomputers or GPUs, and therefore also having a code that is parallelized and quick enough to run is crucial. Of course, you can think that if you're rich enough and you have a big enough supercomputer, all you had to do really is take that recipe, take all the physics that we know and just let it run. And we should just get a universe that looks like our own. The problem is that even with the best supercomputers, if we were to just put all the physics and run it, it would just not work. And one of the big problems as we'll see is to do with scale. Now the goal is of course, to go from the initial conditions that we can measure, for example, from the cosmic micro background and the proportion of dark matter, dark energy, baryons, and even these initial fluctuations in density, and then ultimately get to the galaxy zoo that will contain all the stars, all the planets, asteroids, or even the conditions to generate life. If you can crack this problem in one go, you're probably worthy of more than one Nobel Prize. So far, a lot of progress has been achieved, but this is not possible yet. The main problems are actually summarized here. They include the necessity to actually simulate over eight orders of magnitude in temperature, there's 10 orders of magnitude in column density in terms of how dense the gas or matter can be, but also more than 10 orders of magnitude in scale. And the reason for this is stars are actually powered by quantum effects. The sun can only fuse hydrogen as you'll see in physics 264 because of quantum tunneling. So you actually need quantum effects happening to trigger fusion, but those stars will produce energy that sometimes can be radiated over galaxy scales and keeping track of quantum scales and galaxy cosmological scales is really, really hard, even with the best supercomputers right now. To get a better idea of this, it's really important to have a look at length scales. Remember that astronomers use CGS a lot, so we're gonna use centimeters. Now, one of the main problems of going from initial conditions 
to the full galaxy zoo and everything that is inside galaxies is a necessity to simulate and track physical processes and interactions that are happening in terms of the interparticle distance in stars so that you can actually model the quantum effects leading to fusion all the way down to the full observable universe, which is something like 10 to the 28 centimeters. And this is just not possible at all. One way to deal with this though, is to try to focus on a range of scales where you can do it in supercomputers. And then for all the smaller scales or in some cases, larger scales, you then implement something in your model to tell you about what is happening. For the largest cosmological scales, that focus on, say, the full observable universe down to sort of star clusters, anything that is below is actually implemented as something that is called a subgrid model. Typically, this will be an equation or a set of equations that have been based on modeling of those scales that will actually be feeding in to the larger scales. In physics, many problems can actually just be split apart and they're actually linear. It means that you could just take one component, study it individually, take another component and another component. And when you put them together, you can look at how they work. However, for the universe, this really does not work at all. And specifically because galaxies are very nonlinear. This means that the processes happening at different scales are actually communicating with each other and you can't really make them independent. It means that, for example, as you can see here, the cosmological scales are crucial because it's in the high densities that galaxies will be able to form. But when galaxies form, the way that the gas is coming in is crucial. But also as galaxies form, there's regions which are cold enough, massive enough that they will form stars. We've seen that this means satisfying the condition given by the genes mass. But when stars form, and essentially they start fusion, which is ultimately quantum effect or a quantum phenomena, at some point, some stars will go supernova. And these supernova will affect the scales of galaxies, which will then affect cosmological scales. And therefore, there's this weird communication between the quantum world and the world of galaxies and the universe as a whole, meaning that these things are incredibly hard to model and get it right. If you just split things apart and put it together, then you do not get a universe like our own.